So in this video, we're going to be talking about Roman names and how they give us an interesting insight into Roman culture. Most places in the ancient world, people are named individually. You have names like Pericles or Asher Bunny Paul or Hot Chip Soot. And these names are indicative of the particular person that you're talking about. If there's any need to distinguish between two people with similar names, then you know you might specify descriptively Alcibiades, son of Cleinias, or Dionysius of Halicarnassus. You would add extra information to distinguish the person that you're talking about. Names in the ancient world pertain to individuals, not in Rome. In Rome, the name pertains to the family. And everything about the name is associated with the family and the subordination of the individual. What is important in Roman society is not individual men and women. Roman society, Roman culture, is made up of clans and families. What gives you honor and respect is what you are able to accomplish on behalf of, for the greatness of, your family and for Rome. Seeking to acquire glory for yourself is un-Roman. So for the Romans, what matters is the family, not the individual. Roman society is made up of the family, and we see that in the name. So let's take a look at a particular example. Here is a, an inscription that is actually full of names. This is the Acta Triumphalis. This is the list of people, the formal list of people who have celebrated triumphs, the ritualized parade that you get after a particularly significant military victory. And here we see in the middle a very typical Roman name, Lucius Cornelius Scipio. This is a, a formal inscription, so it also has his filiation, who he's descended from, Luci Filius Gnaei Natus, which we'll talk about in a second. But Lucius Cornelius Scipio is this man's name. So if this says these two lines are the, the notice, the official inscription relating to his triumph, what this says is Lucius Cornelius Scipio was consul and triumphed in the year 494. This is CDXC, and there's an IV cut off here. The year 494 from the founding of the city, which translates in our calendar to the year 259 BCE. We'll talk more about that later. The triumph was over the Carthaginians, the Sardinians, and the Corsicans, and he triumphed on the fifth day from the Ides of March, which is the 11th. Lucius Cornelius Scipio, we're talking about names. And so let's take a closer look at that. What the Romans called a name, the nomen, is the family name. This man's name was Cornelius, the name of his family. And everything about his name is subordinate to that. He belongs to the Cornelius family, this large extended family that the Romans called a gens or a clan. That is what matters about him. He has a first name, a prinomen, but the prinomen also indicates the importance of the family over the individual. What we see here is his prinomen is Lucius. And you'll notice that it's abbreviated. The prinomen is, is always abbreviated because there are only 15 or 20 of them in common circulation. Everyone that you meet is a Lucius or a Marcus or Gaius, or sometimes the, the names are just numbers, Sextus, Quintus, or if you're born after your father died, you get the prinomen posthumus. The names are non-distinctive. Everybody has these same names, and there's, there's so few of them, and they're so common, that you don't even have to spell them out. They're always abbreviated. Not only that, but many families within the, the Roman upper and middle classes have traditions by which the firstborn son is, is always named Gaius or the sons are always named in order Gaius, Lucius, Quintus, or something like this. The names are about, you know, your position within the family, even the prinomen. 
In a formal inscription like this, you would also see the filiation. In this case, we have Luci Filius Gnaei Natus. This means Lucius Cornelius, son of Lucius, grandson of Gnaeus. And so your formal name further emphasizes your lineage, your family, the people that, that you are collectively gaining honor for. Finally, at the end, we have a cognomen, like a nickname. You know, an opportunity you would think to distinguish and uh, single out something that's, uh, that's interesting about this particular person. But even the cognomen works to reinforce the importance of family over the individual. And this happens in two ways. First of all, the Romans are very skeptical of anything that brings out the preeminence of an individual over the community and over the family. So when they give these nicknames tacked on at the end, they're often deprecatory, demeaning or snide in some way, or in some other way significant of, of a lack of specialness. So for example, Scipio, as we see here, Scipio just means a walking stick. At some point uh, in the family tree of this man, Lucius Cornelius Scipio, there was a member of this family who was distinguished by, oh, he's the Cornelius who walks with a cane. One of the most famous Roman individuals that you might potentially have heard of, Julius Caesar, his actual name is Gaius Julius Caesar. Caesar means hairy. The, the hairy guy is the one that I'm talking about. Another famous individual, Marcus Tullius Cicero. Cicero means chickpea, but in this particular context, it was whoever the ancestor was that got this, this cognomen, the chickpea referred to a wart or a carbuncle that was on this guy's face. It was the thing that you saw. As soon as you looked at him, you'd see this chickpea-sized carbuncle on his face. Not only that, but they are inherited. As soon as you have a son and that name is passed on, it's no longer distinguishing of an individual. It becomes uh, indicative of a branch of the family. So by the time we get to Lucius Cornelius Scipio, uh, he is part of a branch that goes back decades and decades within the Cornelius clan. Even the cognomen, even if it's uh, indicative of an individual at some point, uh, it's used to demean that individual, and then it gets passed on and becomes indicative of family and not individual at all. Plus, in direct address, the cognomen was often left off, and so you would see Julius Caesar in the street, you would address him as Gaius Julius. Here are some sample Roman names just to give you a feel. So, Marcus Julius Cicero, wart. Nice Pompeius Magnus. Now here's Magnus. Magnus means the great, right? And so here's an example. You'd think that cognomen refers to somebody who is particularly special and stands out, but it was sarcastic. This is Pompey, important general in the Roman civil wars during the time of Julius Caesar. Pompey originally presented himself to Sulla with an army that he wanted to put at Sulla, the dictator's disposal, in order to accomplish the things that Sulla wanted to do. And Sulla says, great. And Pompey says, okay, but my condition for this is I want to be known from now on as Pompeius Magnus. He's trying to create a place for himself in the turbulence of the Roman civil wars. He's saying, I want to be referred to as Pompey the Great from now on. And so Sulla says, sure, that's fine. Pompey the Great. Everybody heard the sarcastic quotes except for Pompey. And so he goes down in history as Pompeius Magnus, but his name is Pompeius Magnus. Lucius Cornelius Sulla Felix. Felix means um, lucky, fortunate. Uh, Sulla gave himself this cognomen because he considered himself to be fortunate. For his enemies, this was used in a derogatory way. Quintus Caecilius Metellus Pius. That Pius means that he was loyal to his father. Loyal to your father, that was something that the Romans could get behind and honor this particular man for standing by his dad when nobody else did. So sometimes you find a genuinely positive cognomen. Some people are new to uh, Roman society, uh, or haven't held office before, their ancestors haven't held office before, often that means that you uh, that they don't have a cognomen. They don't come from a, a family that has, you know, had occasion to have these names attached to them and branch out like this. So Gaius Marius, 
who will also be meeting during the Civil Wars, has no cognomen. This sort of makes him stand out. Mark Antony, Marcus Antonius, no cognomen. He stands out for not being part of, you know, this pattern of Roman society. Publius Clodius Polcare. Polcare means the beautiful. Clodius was exceptionally handsome and knew it. On very rare occasions, a cognomen might be given formally by the Roman Senate in recognition of an extremely important event, usually a victory over a great enemy. So Publius Cornelius Scipio, who is a descendant of the Scipio, we were just talking about Lucius Cornelius Scipio. Publius Cornelius Scipio is the general who defeated the forces of Hannibal in the greatest war of, of Roman history, the Second Punic War, the war against Hannibal. And for this, he was voted in the Senate the name Africanus, victory over the Africans, which is to say Carthage is North Africa, where Tunisia is now. This happens very rarely because people who get this kind of an honor, it tends to go to their head. And sure enough, Bullius Cornelius Scipio Africanus became a problem for the Roman nobility because he was amassing his own power base and actions had to be taken against him to prevent him from emerging above the rest of the Roman ruling class. Publius Vergilius Maro is the poet Virgil who wrote the Aeneid. And um, one of my favorite names because it's so nice and complicated, Quintus Fabius Maximus Vericosus Cunctator. The Fabius Maximus, the Maximus refers to the size of the branch of the family that he came from, uh, so that's no fun. Vericosus, believe it or not, also refers to warts. And Cunctator, Cunctator means the delayer. He got this name informally from the fact that while he was uh, general against Hannibal, he used delaying tactics, holding back from fighting Hannibal so that the Romans could rebuild their strength after a particularly devastating defeat in which Hannibal had destroyed most of the Roman army. This was very controversial, so he was called the delayer, conctator, in a, a positive way by his friends and a negative way by his enemies. And just to reinforce the point about the prinomen, take a look at the screen. There's only seven prinomena out of all these people. Marcus, Tiberius, Marcus, Gnaeus, Marcus, Marcus, Lucius, Quintus, Gaius, Marcius, Publius, 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 Quintus, Quintus. The prinomena, they're useless except within the family. One of the things that results from a nobility that is focused on the family, the family is what, is what matters, the result of this is that marriage is about connection between families, even more so than in the nobility of other ancient societies. And there, so the result of this is that within the, the Roman ruling class, marriage is the product of uh, arrangements between the heads of each family. The, the problem with arranged marriage is, you know, you end up with a 14-year-old bride and an 80-year-old groom, or vice versa. You end up with people that might get along but don't actually want to have sex with each other. Uh, arranged marriage has the side effect of reducing the number of legitimate children. Not reducing the number of children, just reducing the number of legitimate children. And legitimate children would matter because we're trying to pass on these family names. The Romans have a, a, an interesting and distinctive solution to this, which is if you don't have a male heir to continue your family, you adopt one. Not as a baby, but as a full-grown man. So you take a young man who has already proven himself in a family that is of less significance and arrange for a monetary transaction in which you essentially purchase this son uh, and adopt him into your family. And so the family name gets carried on. The Romans had a way of showing this in their name. So, for example, Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar, only had a daughter by the time he died. He needed a male heir to carry on not only his family, but also the uh, one-man rule of Rome that he had created for himself, which we'll get to in a few weeks. So he adopted a grandnephew whose name was Gaius Octavius, son of Gaius. When you're adopted, you take on the name 
obviously, of the family that you're being grafted onto. That's the whole point. So, so Gaius Octavius becomes Gaius Julius Caesar. He takes on the family name Julius Caesar. And added on to this as a cognomen is the adjectival form of his old family name, Octavianus. So you might be wondering, how does this apply to women? Because we've been talking about men so far. The Romans had a very sharp division between the public world and the private world. The public world was families interacting with each other, whether in politics or in commerce or in any kind of public fashion. Families interact with each other. Each family is its own self-contained opaque unit. And so the families interact with each other only through the men who represent them in the public space. Roman names relate to the public space. Roman women are only designated in terms of the family they belong to. Your name is Julius Caesar. Your daughter gets us the female form of the family name, the nomen. In this case, Julius becomes Julia. If you have another daughter, that daughter is also named Yulia. If you have a third daughter, Yulia. In other words, everyone gets the family name, the nomen. When interacting with each other in public, men add on the other parts, but the fundamental name is the nomen. If you needed to distinguish between two particular daughters named Yulia, which one is older? Yulia Maior, Yulia the Elder, Yulia Minor, Yulia the Younger, Yulia Tertia, which is uh, third Yulia, so on. Uh, descriptively, uh, you might do it the way that we would do it today. You know, you'd be Yulia the Beautiful, Yulia, daughter of that scary guy, whatever. You could single them out however you want. The thing to note here is that the role of women in Rome is reflective of a very sharp division between public and private, and the responsibility that women have to Roman culture and society is on the private side of that line. While we're talking about all this stuff, a quick word about Roman numerals. And so we have 1, 5, 10, 50, 100. These resemble the, the letters of the Roman alphabet. They're actually derived from the Etruscan tally system, which was pictographic, not unlike the way that we today mark down four strokes and then put a line through them. For example, the year that we're living in now, uh, when I'm making this video, MMXXI 2021. You might not believe it, but it is possible to do arithmetic with Roman numerals. You just have to line up place values with each other, just as you do with the Arabic numerals that we have. So our main takeaway here, the Roman name, everything about the Roman name emphasizes the family. And we'll see how this plays out in many aspects of Roman culture. The importance of placing the family ahead of the individual. And for now, that's that.